Hello, welcome to another edition of um, Business Today. My name is Vivian Kai Loko. Today I'll be speaking with the MD of HFC Bank in Ghana, Mr. Robert Lehant. There are a lot of um, key developments in the banking industry here in Ghana. We woke up to news that um, GCB Bank Limited was um, buying UT Bank and um, Capital Bank, both indigenous banks in the country. There have been a lot of discussions around this development. Indeed, the central bank has issued a statement. The um, Ghana Commercial Bank has issued a statement. And um, all people involved have spoken here and there. But we're picking up um, reactions from industry players now. And I, I think it's um, only right that we speak to uh, the managing director of HFC Bank to pick his thoughts on these developments and look at the matters arising. For example, the issue to do with non-performing loans, the issue to do with consolidation, the issue to do with cost of operations in the industry, the issue to do with many of the challenges the, the industry face, and also, of course, their financials. Then later in the um, interview, we speak to him about other matters, plus the bank's um, financials as well. So don't go away. Stay with us. <laughs> So welcome, uh, Mr. Robert Lehan, to Business Today. Thanks for um, joining us this afternoon. Thank you for having me, Vivian. So, I mean, the biggest news in the industry is, of course, the um, um, acquisition or the process of the purchase agreement for, from, for GCB Bank to um, buy out UT Bank as well as um, Capital Bank. You are in the industry. How did you take the news? Well, you know... As I told my staff this morning, the closure of any bank so, is one that always leads to a certain degree of uncertainty. But at the end of the day, I have been one that has always been saying that I think there is need for consolidation in the industry. Um, and therefore, I believe that oh, it's a step in the right direction. I think it's also a step in ensuring that we have strong banks in the industry. And again, you know, we have been plagued with a number of non-performing loans and I understand in the Bank of Ghana, they mentioned the high level of non-performing loans and the fact that the banks were illiquid. It's also a step that people and depositors need to also stand up and understand that they themselves have a responsibility where they place their money. What do you think went wrong in this situation? Well, you know, I think it's a number of factors, really. One, I think um, banking is about size. And I've always made that point before that you need to have a certain critical mass to operate as a bank effectively. Um, because it costs about 100, 150 million CDs a year to run a bank. And therefore, when you have that size and you have that cost to meet, when you take in deposits, and I mean, banking is really a simple business. We buy money and we sell money. So if you think about it, you are buying money from the public. You are a small bank. You have to meet your operating costs. It means, therefore, the spreads that you have to lend the money at and be able to pay your depositors their interest is very high. So small banks results in wider spreads just for them to break even. When you have to lend the money at a high rate, of course, if you have to lend the money at 40% instead of another player who lends the money at 30%, it means the person who is borrowing money at 40% is not as secure a customer as one who could get loans at 20 and 30%. So you're lending money to a more high-risk customer base. And basically, that combination never works in banks. Your non-performing loan goes up. Your operating costs is something that you have to continue to do. And then you have depositors' funds that you have to pay depositors their interest. Eventually, a bank will start having liquidity problems. Depositors will not be able to get their money when they, when they place it. And the bank will start to incur losses. Um, and I'm sure when the dust is settled and you take a detailed look of what happened to Capital Bank and UT Bank, 
It's a combination of those factors. But what people say that this surely should have ha may have happened over a process, and during that time, the two uh, banks involved should have realized and set things back in perspective, no? Yeah, but you know, when you have an operating cost, as I said, you have branches, you have to, you have to pay staff, you have to pay rent, you have to run a computer system. At the end of the day, there's a certain fixed cost just to operate. And therefore, yes, when the loan starts to go bad, and no bank gives a loan with the expectation that it will go bad, and you all, as a, most, most banks, hire professionals, and therefore they do the analysis with the hope that the loan will go good. But then you also have a lot of unscrupulous customers there that, that really exploit the system. So when the loan starts to go bad, all right, is when the problem starts to arise and you can't, your, your interest income goes bad um, and it's a domino effect. So it is not easy to get yourself out of that system as long as it happens. And therefore, there's a lot of time that I'm sure the central bank, I think I understood in their question and answers, talked about they were monitoring these banks for a while. All right, they asked and they supported these banks for a while with deposits and so forth. And then I think they mentioned that they asked, it really means that the equity of the bank just actually got eroded over time and there was a need for the shareholders to bring more equity in. And if they can't, then the bank eventually ends up with where they, what, what has happened. But, but what happens with due diligence in all these line of affairs? Well, you know, again, due diligence is about a point in time, eh? mm -hmm. all right? When you do a due diligence, you do a due diligence at a point in time. Um, I mean, when I bought HFC, I did a due diligence in 2012, all right? When I eventually came here in 2015 was a different story. So it's about a point in time, and you will do a loan, and as I said, when I do my due diligence on a loan in the beginning, um, you know, you always hear banks is in a, in a, in a very, you, there's, there's a, it's not a win-win. We almost always a, a, a view as a lose-lose. Because when we don't give loans and we always want security, we are being told that banks are too conservative, mm -hmm. right? That all you need is security and you don't take a chance on people. But when you, when you give a loan without security, and you have nothing to rely on, this is what sometimes happens. And you have unscrupulous customers out there who take advantage of situations and actually don't pay. So the reality of these two banks is I'm sure there are customers over $1 billion worth of loan customers that are there who did not pay their loans. And those are the people that have resulted in the bank re reaching to a position of where they are. But the, this issue about unscrupulous clients and all that, it appears it's a thing in the industry. In your opinion, how do you think we can deal with that issue? Well, that's another story. I mean, the industry itself, I mean, in Ghana, there's a, the registration of mortgages. It's an extremely long process. Everyone understands the problem with the registration process. So if you take a mortgage, sometimes to register your mortgage, it takes an extremely long. So there are certain systemic problems in the industry that needs to be fixed, right? Um, and that, that, for example, is a major problem. The court system. Um, a lot of people are aware that, well, you know, why should I pay my loan? We go to court. The court system will take three or four years um, before your case is even called in some cases, right? And because of that, people then exploit that system. Right. So we need to put systems in place if we want to get the sector properly operating. A proper credit bureau where people are compelled to have to give information by law 
and therefore you could carry on with your credit rating in developing countries and in a number of underdeveloped countries. Those are basic tenants that you have to have to have a secure banking system. Proper laws in place for registering your mortgages, proper laws for foreclosures, proper credit bureaus. Without those things, then you have inefficiencies. So if I give you a loan, if you had a loan with another bank or another player, unless I knew somebody in that bank, I will never find out. Mm -hmm. So then you are able to perpetuate your fraud in another place. Mm -hmm. So we have to put a number of pillars in place if we are going to secure the banking sector to prevent things like this from happening. Because the reality is when things like this happen, is the whole country that ends up paying to secure the depositors' funds. Even depositors themselves have a role to play. Because depositors themselves, they believe, again, because of the, the feeling that banks are all bad. You know, everybody believes banks just wants to make money. All right? And that's the negative thing. Um, perception, perception that, that, that people, people have of banks. banks and therefore when you come and you say to me I want to get some I want a rate on my deposit and I say sir T-bills is now 11% I will give you 12 ah what, the reason why you don't want to give me the money is because you as a bank want to cheat me and therefore why is this other bank giving me 25% well, there is like your answer, because risk and return. So we all play a part in what has happened. Everyone who pushed UT for a 25% deposit when they knew that the market was really 12 and 13, right? They play a part in the demise of UT. All the loans customers who got loans and didn't pay they played a part in the demise of UT and capital. All the people who are renting apartments and renting branches and renting it at those exorbitant prices, $40 a square foot, etc., they played a part in the demise of UT. And at the end of the day, when these things happen, you, the small citizen, is the one that also plays a plays the price. Mm. No, you, you make it look like we're all guilty of this development. But there are some um, um, people who believe the regulator has been too laid back with this issue about UT Bank and Capital Bank, and indeed with certain developments in the banking industry. Do you think the, the regulator is being as forceful as it should be? For example, you talk about the Credit Reference Bureau. We know about three companies currently are in that space. Are they not doing what they should do? Is it not good enough? And if not, how come the regulator is not being firm on these developments? Well, I mean, if you heard the words, and I was very heartened by the governor of the central bank when he spoke about the whole regulation system, and I will dare say that the bad loans in the banking sector did not develop, Over yes, overnight. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these bad loans came about when, so again, all players, when, when the regulator actually had audit firms doing audits on each other, mm -hmm. all right? If you remember, that brought out a whole big, a, num, a, a, a whole junk of loans that were actually bad. I mean, when I took over HFC Bank, it was supposedly had a, a non-performing loan portfolio of 10%. By the time I looked at it, it was actually more like 22%. Mm. So there are a number of loans that were there that because of, because of the um, non-conformance to, to the regulations, all right, they were carried on the books as performing instead of it being non-performing. So I agree. I agree that stricter regulation would have helped in this situation. But it is not just about the regulator. The regulator, yes, I agree, could have in some cases, right, be a little bit firmer. I agree 
the regulators in their attempt to try to have Ghanaian banks. You know, we have to keep it Ghanaian banks. When, for example, the capital of those banks were increased. Mm -hmm. And remember, they had concessions for Ghanaian banks versus foreign banks. And people then were very much supportive of that. Well, there's a price that one has to pay. And we can't, there's, we are all part of an ecosystem. And when you have a price, when you want something, it comes out and you pay for it in another part of the system. All right? So we need to have banks with proper capital. Capital is your cushion against things like this happening. So you are running an economy, and if you don't have things like what I just said before, a legal system that works fast, all right, a registration of mortgage system that is in place, a proper credit bureau system that works, clearly your market is a little bit more risky than when those things are in place. And therefore, this market should have, the banks need to carry slightly more capital than other markets because the market itself is slightly more risky because of these inefficiencies. You understand? Yes. And therefore, there is nothing wrong with banks having to have more capital. But we have been talking about this for how long? And everybody complains and complains and everybody lobbies and eventually get puts out. But the banks need more capital. And we don't need to go far. I just came from Nigeria this weekend. 178 million people. How many banks? 14 banks. 14 banks. So you next is you're saying that there are too many banks here. Way too many banks. How do we catch this? Because over the years, we've seen the, the central bank increasing the capital requirement to force banks to merge, in some cases consolidate. What you see is these banks go out, get the capital and add on and move on. And then it comes back to the same issue. The central bank is due to announce a new capital requirement. We've been waiting forever for that announcement. But it's obvious they will increase again. What is the way forward in dealing with um, decreasing the number of banks and having more stronger banks with capital in the country? But, but first to begin, the way forward is, do you think that should happen? Do you think that should happen? That's the question. Right? <laughs> and if the answer is... If we agree that is what's supposed to happen, then we put things in place to make it happen. But we seem to have a lot of discussions and we go wrong and wrong as to what we should do. Clearly, as I said, I think the banks need to consolidate. And we, they take so long for the decisions to happen. By the time the decisions happen, it's almost like the amount of capital you're supposed to do is back towards what you should have done a long time ago. And then the governor was very correct in what he said. There's a lot of conversation about how much capital you need to get in, but nobody ensures that you, the people who don't have the capital, that they exit. So the governor, I understood last time, showed how the minimum capital now is 120. How many banks have that amount? Mm -hmm. And if you don't, what are you doing to get it? Mm -hmm. But if you are allowed to operate, allowed to take deposits, mm -hmm. right? And how many depositors, even your big institutional depositors, will say, well, let me look at your capital. You know, you are below the capital requirement. And therefore, my deposit is at risk. I will not put my money with you. The questions are not asked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people just want the rate, right? Nobody looks at the basic questions to ask. And therefore, it stays like that. So we have to want it. And we have to then put systems in place to make it happen. We have a law that says it's 120. And that law, even before they increase the capital, we should ensure that every single bank that is not 120, 
given a certain timeline or you have to merge. It's simple. And if you do that, the mergers will happen. But if you say it and then you don't implement it, well, it's no more than if you have a child and, well, you know, you keep talking and you're telling, oh, well, the child will eventually realize that nothing will happen. Was there a better way that this situation we found this morning could have been handled by the regulator? Well, you know, I mean, I think the closure of, our, as I said, the closing of the decision to close any bank is, is a very difficult one. And, there are, and, I, and I think, as the Bank of Ghana said, there are a number of considerations that you have to take into consideration. Most important, you don't want, you want to curtail systemic risk. You want to people to understand that the money is secure. And I think from that perspective, I think they did a good job in making everyone believe that their money is secure. So you have to move swiftly in doing it, all right? Um, I think over time, there's going to be some fallout with regard to GCB with the amount of branches now that they will have. But I think that will be easily managed down the road. So by and large, I think the fact that we could talk about it today, I looked at my branch and my bank, and we didn't have any problems, right? I think there has been no systemic problems. I think the Bank of Ghana could get a, at least a clear above average, close to excellent grade for the way in which they handled. It will never be perfect, but when you look at how bad it could have been to where we are now, I would say it was handled pretty well.